if you want to make systemic change in something, you actually need a bit more of a plan. Most kids don't really get an education that helps them flourish and find joy and success and happiness in life for a lot of different reasons. There's an amazing Steve Jobs quote, which was, like paraphrasing, it was everything around you that you call life was just made by other people. And once you realize that and realize that you can change it, you can build your own things, you can influence it, kind of never the same again after you have that realization. That's really how all progress humanity has ever made has come about. It's just a product of human talent and intelligence. And so if we can amplify all the potential, all the, all the talent and intelligence on the planet and help people find and cultivate their capacities and, and their greatest talents, then I think we can just make an amazing future. I think we can make life even better. Hey everyone, welcome back to Patronage. I'm Amber Athton, partner at Patron, and today I am joined by Sam Chowdhury and Liam Don, the co-founders of Class Dojo, an edtech company recently valued at over a billion dollars. During the back-to-school season every year, Class Dojo ranks among the top downloaded apps in the Apple Store. In the US alone, one in six families with kids under 13 are using Class Dojo on a daily basis. Globally, Class Dojo serves over 51 million children. That's one in 20 kids on earth across 180 countries. I'm so excited to have them both on the show today. We're gonna to be diving into how you apply lessons from gaming and social into your product, growing engaged communities, and making learning fun. Enjoy. Welcome to Patronage. It's very exciting to have you both here. Great to be here. I'm excited to dive into so many great topics today. Um, I think, you know, something that's always stood out to me in our conversation, Sam, is when you talk about Class Dojo's purpose, you talk so much about humanity flourishing and, um, you know, Class Dojo's vision. In, in, the, in that same way, you know, to give a kid an education that they love. And, you know, why, why does that matter? What, what do you mean by that? I think in the earliest days, the days I was just describing, um, the YC mantra was always just make something people want. And so, you know, we were kind of like, oh, we, we've got the beginnings of something that people feel like they want. Um, I'd always thought that if you want to make systemic change in something, you actually need a bit more of a plan. So we weren't just trying to make an app, right? The, the reason Liam and I left the UK and, and left so much behind there to, to come here and, and build what's become Dojo is because there was a real purpose mission behind it. Um, and a hope in a way, I think in the early days, it's more of a hope. You hope you can achieve something great there. And we've been noodling on how, you know, most kids um, don't really get an education that helps them flourish and find joy and success and happiness in life um, for a lot of different reasons. Um, and I, I remember around the time there was that, um, there was an amazing Steve Jobs quote, which was, I, I'm going to butcher it, but it was something like paraphrasing. It was, it was everything around you that you call life was just made by other people. And once you realize that and realize that you can change it, you can build your own things, you can influence it, um, you're kind of never the same again after you have that realization. And when you think about that, that's really how all progress humanity has ever made has come about. Like it's just a product of human talent and intelligence. And so if we can amplify all the potential, all the, all the talent and intelligence on the planet and help people find um, and cultivate their capacities and, and um and their greatest talents, then I, th I think we can just make an amazing future. I think we can, I think we can make life even better. Um, and I think the brightest future would be one where everybody on the planet gets this chance to discover and develop their greatest capacities. And I think we ought to. I think that's a future we ought to build. It's worth. It's worth. Um, it's worth fighting for. It's worth building. And we're like, well, where we are today is I think most people don't get that kind of um, experience. They don't really get to. Um, the chance to discover what's special about themselves and then to make something of it through their lives. Um, and I think that's sad. And, you know, I think school is the institution that is most supposed to help you do this. And it's a really, really hard job. Like I've, I've worked in schools, you know, if you've got 500 kids with 500 different sets of hopes and dreams and talents and so on, it's really hard to be all things to all people. And we're like, well, look, maybe we can build a company that, that helps and is like kind of complementary to school and, um, that's what Dojo is intended to be. And so this mission statement came from that <clears throat> idea that um, individual flourishing at, done at very large scale would lead to humanity flourishing. And so our contribution, I think, could be, well, if we can reach every kid on the planet and help them get an education that they really love, one that helps them tap into really like 
the best of what's inside them um, and their own passions and interests, then I, I think you could make something. You, you could, I think I think it would be an amazing world to live in. Here, here, couldn't agree more. I, I, I think like the 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 fact that you know Class Dojo is this vehicle for encouragement is so fantastic because the more encouragement you get as a kid, the more confident you feel in your abilities to, uh, you know, build things. And um, I, I think actually games are so brilliant at that, like giving you a sense of progression, giving you a sense of uh, like multiplayer cooperation, like a path to mastery, like all of that is so embedded in in how you build really great endlessly playable games. And so Liam, maybe maybe we can talk a bit about like how, how have you thought about building that into Class Dojo um, like, and making learning feel more like a game? Um, you know, outside of just getting the sticker, like how have you structured the world? I think that, you know, some, a lot of what Sam was, was touching on there is, is some of what's um, missing in a lot of, you know, a lot of education experiences, which is that, um, you know, it's kind of a series of hoops that you jump through. Like the, the part that I think is, uh, yeah, and the goal is made very clear to you and what you have to do is made very clear to you, um, what you have to do to achieve that goal. And so I think if you only kind of solve those kinds of problems with, with a very clear sort of mandated way to solve them, um, you start seeing the world in that way where you're, you're kind of like, well, for, for everything I will kind of ask, well, tell me what I need to do and I will do that thing in order to get that grade or get that, um, <clears throat> you know, college, college degree. Um, but I think, I think what's missing a lot is sort of working under ambiguity. A lot, a lot of the time the goal is very clear, but how to get there is not that clear. Uh, and I think really great games and, and also, um, games that take a lot to master as well, um, usually have a lot of ways to achieve something. So whether you're talking kind of competitive esports, you know, like League of Legends or something, um, it isn't linear at all, like how the best players will play, like they will do surprising strategies and so on, because the, the game has so many different sort of branching options. Um, and similarly in kind of simulation games or like a Sim City, there are, you know, an infinite number of choices that inform your city or city skylines for, for kids these days, because Sim City's kind of fallen off. Was one of my but, absolute favorite games though, I have yeah, to yeah, say. Yeah. Sim City, Rollercoaster Tycoon, like the endless outcomes, like, oh, so Right, great. right, right. Yes. Yeah, and, and the endless outcomes and the way that you drive them and, and the sort of creativity that goes into that. Um, but both the creative side and also the, you know, I don't know, all of my, none of my citizens have water and I'm going to have to, you know, build stuff <laughs> yeah. over this. Like there are challenges, but the, the ways to overcome those challenges aren't just kind of uh, linear. So with all that said, I think a lot of the um, approach that we're taking with Dojo Islands is uh, we want to kind of create a virtual world that has uh, lots of different options for how to do things. You know, it's it's kind of like a summer camp or a, a playground or uh, it's very kind of sandboxy. It doesn't have, um, there, there are things you can unlock, uh, but there are lots of ways to do that if you want to sort of climb high up to access one of the mystery portals, you know, you might be able to build up there or you might be able to kind of uh, press all the switches that unlock something else and so on. Like there are lots of kind of paths to achieve an objective. And I think, uh, and, and also not everything is even objective based. So uh, yeah, putting a lot of that kind of Sim city ish uh, and, and Minecraft is a good reference point too, um, you know, in terms of its open endedness. Uh, but I think we can, take that a little further. I think Minecraft with the building is awesome and you can similarly build stuff in Dojo Islands, uh, but you can also go a bit further and start to kind of lightly script different behavior and create a, a switch that triggers another block and things like that. Um, so yeah, the, the open-endedness. Uh, and of course, though, uh, another huge factor is uh, playing with other people. And so I think, you know, where I think we had a unique opportunity that, that no one else could do, you know, we have lots of great ideas about what would make uh, make it a great experience. But the unique thing that we have that other people don't is this huge network of kids. Uh, and we can sort of guarantee that we can have a group of kids who all know each other in real life playing together. And so if you look at something like a Roblox, it's much more like a traditional online game where you log on and there's a bunch of random people and you're running around with them. Uh, and parents for, for this age group don't love that. Oh, you know, it's not It's not great. But half, I mean, it's crazy that half of you as kids play Roblox every yeah. day. 
I mean, right, right. It's, it's, really- it's such a huge, huge thing. And yeah, I mean, you, it's it's very interesting to hear like the impetus perhaps of some, of, you know, why you're building this is the parents aren't really thrilled with with the way it works today. Right. I think I think they they're under a lot of pressure. Like their kid gets to be say eight years old and they want to start playing Roblox and they're like, ah, but I kind of know that that's uh, the big the big internet with lots of other kids on. Like, is my kid ready for that? Um, and so our kids are in the age of sort of six to 10. Uh, and there really aren't a lot of places where kids of that age can hang out and do that in a high agency way, like where they can, um, even in, I mean, in real life too, in real life, they're mostly kind of, uh, shuttled from the school to the after school club. And it's always in a context where there are kind of grown up rules and things like that. Um, so we want to give them this sort of playground space where, uh, they make the rules and they feel a lot of agency in that environment. That's uh, and, and it's for this very kind of um, sensitive age group. You know, I think it can be the best place on the internet for them. Um, and maybe the first real experience that they have on the internet, the first sort of um, like the starter pool almost where, where they know their parents know they're only playing with kids they know in a safe environment. Um, and that's kind of how they get introduced to the idea of hanging out with people online uh, before, you know, at the age of, 10, 11, 12 or something, you, you don't want to throw them straight into Instagram, I think is, is my point. I think, I think it's good to, to have some healthy interactions with, with people you really know online first. Uh, yeah, and I, I, I feel somewhat nostalgic because I feel like Club Penguin gave me this version of this experiment uh, experience. You know, after school, you log in, you play in Club Penguin. Um, uh, I, I, I don't know if I could say I was like learning that. It was more like I was just playing to have fun. No, but it's a, it's a fantastic re- uh, reference point. Actually, um, fun fact, uh, Lane Merrifield, who's one of the founders of Club Penguin, um, is working on Dojo Islands with us. So he's, he's a, a full time at Class Dojo. So I, I kind of chat to him every day. Uh, so there's a lot, lot that he learned about Club Penguin, both good and bad, I think, um, that we can apply here. And, you know, some of it's going to be more learning focused, but they went through so much with, with online safety and stuff as well. And, uh, he'll often say that we're kind of doing it on easy mode because we have this pre-existing network. So it's much easier to, to make that safe. Sam, how do you see the like pre-existing network gelling with Dojo Islands? We're kind of an odd company with this, um, Amber, because um, I, th- I think it was maybe like a year in or so. It was quite early on. Um, we wrote down this this plan. It was like the mission strategy and, and, and like essentially the plan for Dojo. And um, what's crazy is everybody still reads that today when they join. <clears throat> and I think there were just like a few parts of it that really um, have just stood up over time. So um, there were a couple of steps to the plan, right? And so the, the first thing, you know, the thing we talked about was the the way for teachers to encourage kids and, and help them create these more positive classrooms. That was kind of like the entry point. What happened quite quickly, maybe five or six months after that, <clears throat> Um, we realized that teachers really wanted to bring families into the equation as well. Um, prior to that, Dojo was just in the classroom. Um, so we expanded quite quickly to giving families accounts. And so you ended up with this kind of triangle of communication between teachers and kids and families. Initially, they were just sharing the little little stickers, but pretty quickly that expanded to sharing messages and then pictures and then videos. And naturally, the most interesting thing for a parent is what happened at school today. It became like this cozy community around every classroom, you know, where it was just, it's only the people in that classroom and around that classroom, and there's a hard line around it. Um, but what happened next, like, really took us by surprise. So we would land in a school, one classroom would use um, Dojo, they'd create this little community, and then the teacher would start to tell the next one, kind of down the hallway, or the family would tell the next teacher, or, or next year's teacher. And pretty quickly, Dojo would start to mushroom out through the school. Um, and that's now happened at quite large scales we've talked about. So in a way, Dojo started to become, I mean, a bit like maybe Slack did in organizations or, um, or others have done, um, like Facebook might be at colleges, but in, in this like closed and private and safe way, Dojo just started to, to, to become the communication backbone um, for many, many communities of teachers and kids and families. And so I, I think, you know, we're one of the larger communities on the planet now for, for this demographic. It's a closed community. It's totally safe and, and, and trusted it's still entirely word of mouth, which is really crazy. And, um, um, and it's spread kind of all over the world. So I think that the community and, and growing the community, that's, that's not done, right? There's billions of kids on the planet um, in our demographic. 
So there's a long way to go there still. Um, but it was a great first, first step. Um, the next step, if you think about the mission, was it wasn't just to reach every kid on earth. It was then to give them an education they'd love. And so the, I think the idea for us was always that once we had the beginnings of community, we could start to um, build or enable some products or services that would give kids incredible learning experiences far beyond what they might um, get today. And so the way I think about it is kind of the, the community came first and, and now we, we have the beginnings of our first few products and services that, uh, that I think could really change kids' lives quite a bit, the learning experience quite a bit. Um, and I think, I think the Dojo Islands is, is, is uh, I think it's, it's could be incredible and I think it could be very, very interesting for lots of kids. And so with, with islands, um, you know, you've got in the app, you, you're, you're getting this experience of community and uh, you, you're also, you know, being rewarded for, you know, you're getting awarded points for working hard, perseverance. Um, uh, and then do you, so will kids in the classroom um, mix with other kids in different communities in this Dodo Islands world? Or is it just sp still specific um, to that one classroom that they'll have their avatar and they can run around and... Yeah, there are, there, are kind of, uh, there are two sides to it, I guess, and, and one that we're kind of developing a bit more this year. So um, what's what's out right now that we've got a few million kids playing is they have a classroom island for one particular classroom or one particular teacher. Um, and what we're seeing is, uh, which actually surprised us, is that they often use that um, during school time as well. So it might be like a Friday or uh, increasingly we've added more sort of challenges that relate to lesson content as well, um, which is an awesome experience to see this and for the kids because you've got 30 kids in one room all kind of in the same 3D environment so they can yell at each other and um, say, come over here, that kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> but we're also building out the home side a bit more, which is where you have a personal island that you can link, oops, link up to lots of other islands. Uh, so you, you can kind of connect to a few different friends, say, uh, Th you know, three or four other friends and all of your islands sort of smush together and you can kind of build them uh, as one. Um, and so that's sort of more the home side where you can <clears throat> uh, create new environments and they're much more customizable. So the class island is um, a bit more uh, something that we push out. Like it, it gets re-themed at Halloween. It gets re-themed at um, uh, right now we're entering the fall season. Um, whereas the personal island is more like you're in the driver's seat if you want to change the whole theme of it or if you want to gear it more around being like a platform game for your friends, you can do that. Um, so those are the two halves and one's more school centric, one's more um, home centric. I'm very excited to potentially get a demo of this. I, um, I talking about Club Penguin. I, um, I interviewed one of the co-founders for my book that I wrote earlier this year called the, the Rise of Virtual Communities, and and we go so deep into how you create uh, just yeah this genuine sense of fun. They had a lot of like Christmas and fall parties, and I I, I think it's so brilliant uh, to give kids that space to like, you know, have fun, but also, you know, they'll, they'll learn at the same time. Um, and, and one thing I wanted to point out, as you're saying this, given the, given that, you know, part of what we're discussing today is like turning the classroom into a community is it's such a brilliant strategy to allow teachers to set the values of the classroom, because so much of what I've learned in community building is that you have to give the, you know, the builder, the community manager, the authority to sort of set like what the tone and the values of that community are to give this sense of ownership. So it, it, it's cool to see how important like teachers are in making these communities um, successful. And, and maybe we can talk a little bit about that. Like the, the, there is a teacher community. Class Dojo is, is obviously free for teachers. And how does that work with, with islands? Love to hear a bit more about teachers. Well, maybe it's, it's helpful to understand how, how the community stuff started actually. Because um, Dojo itself, in the early days, was a product to create these classroom communities like we've talked about. Um, <clears throat> um, we had this very funny uh, and, and kind of very consequential school visit uh, to a school in San Francisco as a middle school. And um, we were observing this teacher. Her name was Jenna. Uh, and she's a great teacher. She was a science teacher. Um, and, you know, we, we took our notes and interview notes and went back. And I'm sure we were doing some kind of product research. Um, <clears throat> then like a month later, uh, I get an email from Jenna. 
And she was like, hey, um, I'd love to, um, you know, I've got the summer off uh, from teaching. I'd, I'd love to come and intern at Dojo. And we must have been like seven or eight people or something at the time. And we were like, I, I don't know what you would do here, but like, please, sure, great, you know. And, um, and so she came, she came by and I think she was working on some customer support type stuff. <clears throat> and towards the end of the summer, she, <laughs> she kind of produced this surprise presentation that she'd done, which was um, exploring how Class Edge was growing and more specifically exploring how our community felt like they owned and wanted to, to propagate Dojo and they owned the message. So there, there's the ownership of the values at the classroom level, then there's the owning like what Class Dojo is and what it could become. Um, and she was like, look, I think, I think we have the chance to build an amazing community of <clears throat> the most passionate teachers on the planet <clears throat> um, who want to give kids an education they love. And I, I think I should do that. And, you know, Jenna joined then. She's still at the company today. Um, and it's been pretty amazing. She, she, she kind of laid all the foundations for, for the community that we've, we've built around the world today. And it's really kind of quite crazy. I mean, like when we go on, on holiday or vacation, we try and make a point to just drop into schools wherever we're going. And uh, Liam, I don't want to steal your thunder, but I, th I thought this, there was some years ago, Liam went to, uh, it was Bonaire, right? In the, in the Caribbean, like a, like a, for, for a break. And I think there are like three elementary schools in the whole island and you dropped in and, and they're like, all of them were using Dojo. Yeah. Well, I looked, I looked up and I, mean, I looked at them up and I, then I emailed and asked if I could kind of visit and see how they were using it. And, <clears throat> um, yeah, I visited one of the schools of, of those three and oh. yeah, all, all the teachers were using class, class Dojo there. So yeah. I just sort of ch chatted to them, saw how they were using it. And, um, yeah, it was sort of like, you know, there's like a way you kind of hope that people use it. And, and so <laughs> I kind of came back and I was like, they're, they're using all the features. They're using school. They're using <laughs> <laughs> that is um, incredible. Right. I, I think it's so brilliant to hear both of you say how much you love speaking to users, like still, like even from day one all the way to now where you have, you know, millions and millions of kids all over the world using this. So many teachers, parents love and use your product, yet you just you know, you continue to stay close to users, which feels like a key to succeeding as a founder. So that's, that's, that's really awesome to hear. Um, any, actually on that note, you know, it would be, it would be great to, to, to hear from each of you, your founder journey in this, like what has kept you, you know, resilient and, and going outside talking to users that give you that energy? Like, look, I think, I think I got very, very lucky in the start. So in, in at least a few ways, but one of them was that, um, uh, which is probably the, the second most important of the two, but one of them is that I think there was just a, a problem that I was really excited about. And I think Liam was really excited about, and we picked a problem that was meaningful to us. And not, not, not every company has to go that way, but it certainly for me has helped with long-term engagement interests. I'm like, look, if we could give every kid on earth an education they love, like what greater contribution could I make with my life? Like that seems like a really worthwhile and important mission. And so I think there's like a deep sense of purpose that comes with solving a problem that is both personally meaningful and societally meaningful. Um, so that's one. And I think the most important thing, honestly, is uh, was meeting Liam. Like he's my best friend. We built this thing together. Um, we, we lived together here in this apartment for seven years. Um, and, and just having a, and, and I didn't, and the, the honest truth is when we started out, we didn't know each other that well. We'd known each other for some months. And so it was a great risk. Right? We could have been terrible. You hear all the time about co-founders falling out and hating each other and all this. And it could have happened to us. And um, I think um, what I've discovered is that Liam was just kind of like the perfect co-founder for me in, in the sense that we, I think we share a ton of values, but we express them in completely different ways and focus on different areas and um, it's been like uh, just an incredible partnership. Um, so I think those, those two, and then, you know, when you have that, I think at the start of the company, like that kind of relationship, it then generalizes more and more, you know, the, the Dojo's team is tiny. It's only a few hundred people serving all these tens of millions of kids. Every single person is an absolute killer in their seat. You know, like the, the talent density in the company is, is really quite incredible. And so I, I think at some level, it's quite simple. I'm like, I picked a problem or, and we picked a problem. I think that we care about, we're doing with people that we love and respect. And then the, the plan is kind of seems to be working, you know, we're not done. We're, we're very much in, in the, in the thick of it, but um, I think that makes it e easy to, easy to continue. 
yeah, huge plus one to that. <laughs> huge plus one. Very, yeah. very, very, very strong uh, story and, and advice around like, yeah, choose a problem that you genuinely would be happy to work on for at least 10 years and then find yourself a Liam if you can. <laughs> I will. I will give a give one one additional thing to that, which is the find a problem thing. I think sometimes you, um, or something I see in founders a lot that went I, that happened to me. I think it was around sort of twenty eighteen. I was too myopic about what our problem was, or I, I was kind of like, okay, cool, we're building a messaging app. We're gonna, you know, build some more features. We're gonna, <clears throat> um, you know, even though that wasn't really what we were saying it was, but we were trying to move different metrics and like most of our action was, uh, was working towards uh, those product features. Um, and I was starting to get a bit kind of, you know, I, I didn't see all of the other possibilities for, for what it could be. I didn't really sort of see the platform that we built. And I hear that from founders a lot, uh, sometimes that, um, <clears throat> you know, like a few years in you, you were all excited in year one and building stuff and, or, or you were too busy, you know, trying to keep the lights on to, uh, to make everything work. And then sort of about three or four or five, however many years in, uh, you know, you're like, oh, do I want, like, was my passion, you know, like farming, like yield enhancement software or or was it something else? And like what I'd say um, to those people is like, you can zoom out and look at the kind of the space you're in. There are tons of problems probably for you to solve that are adjacent or just like look at your own company in a different way. Um, so I think I did that around that time. And like a lot of what we're, talking about here like we already always had the same vision always had the same kind of uh uh values but i think our path to get there it was around sort of 2019 or maybe 2020 i think (laughs) covid probably helps with this but helps give you perspective um but we started to think more expansively about what we were really doing and what we could really be doing uh and i think that was like incredibly invigorating you know uh, that many years into the company and i i you know, I'm incredibly excited about what we're doing. Um, so yeah, that'd be my advice. Like pick a, pick a good problem, but you can always reevaluate your problem and like, look at it as look at it through a different lens and you'll, you'll kind of see new opportunities maybe that uh, you don't see when you're in day to day because day to day you're thinking about how we're going to hit the numbers. Next yeah. You're in the weeds. Yeah. Taking yeah. that time to zoom out and you know, it, it's not, you don't even, that's not a pivot. That's just, Looking at it yeah. from a different lens, like you said. Right. I um I know we we kind of got a sort of five minutes left on this chat, and I would love to ask a few more questions about the future of education and how you know making learning feel like a game is part of what you are both building. Um, one one question here: Is attending school in person still? important there's a lot of interesting stories data like do you know a lot of kids increase homeschooling how how important is the classroom oh i i, I can shine out liam that you're, you're way on this one i mean my, my take is that we've put an impossible set of expectations on school like we expect school to be this great place for your kids while you're out working we expect it to It'd be great for every one of the academic subjects that they're interested in. We expect it to nurture their interests, to help them make friends, to socialize, to, you know, myriad kind of expectations. And I kind of think, um, like any institution, there are there are some things that your local school will be really great at and some things that it won't be that good at. And I think um, you can imagine, like, some, some schools are really good at helping kids um, have a great playground, a safe playground to play in during the day while mom and dad or, or parents are at work. Um, uh, and so I think that that would be like an, int- an important job for school to continue to do, for example. There may be some of the other jobs, like helping you explore your passions and interests and find a community of other kids that are also into those or that it might be harder for school to do. And that that's okay. Like, that's not a failing. I, I think we should just complement school with the services that um, that enable you to get everything you want. Ima- imagine, you know, it's a bit like asking your local movie theater to be both an amazing theater experience and give you all the infinite choice of Netflix or whatever. Like it just, it, they're two separate services for a reason. They're both valid. They both serve different needs. They both should exist in the world. And I kind of think, um, I kind of think school of school a bit like that. Like I think families ought to think about what does their school do really well and then what, what, what is being missed and what can be done better elsewhere. And then hopefully there are consumer services that can, that can help with that. Yeah, supplement the curriculum with technology. And uh, yeah, I guess like, you, you know, 
the importance of having those real world interactions in a learning environment and, you know, everything you're building with Dojo Islands, like, and how that can still play a role. Like, Liam, how does that sort of balance in your mind? To me, I think there's still a space, you know, a, a reason to get together in person. Um, I mean, there is a practical one for school that, you know, it's it's performing the job of childcare for a huge number of people, right? Um, but I also think that uh, when kids aren't together uh, at all, <clears throat> there's an idealistic view that they'll sort of uh, use, you might use something like Dojo Islands to get together. I still think a kernel of, of in-person relationship is important, though. I don't think you can replace that entirely. Um, but I think it can play a valid role there where, um, kids, again, going back to my earlier point, kids don't have a lot of chance to build sort of, to do high agency activities together, to do, to do really un unstructured play. And I think the unstructured play uh, part is the most important part. So if they, if you are just seeing kids at school, like whether you are or, or you're not, uh, either way, I think you need sort of a place for unstructured play with other kids. Um, and that has, you know, been in, in pretty steep decline for the last 20, 30 years. Uh, so whether it's virtual or in person, in our case, it's virtual. I want to kind of provide more of that unstructured play opportunity for, for kids. And, and have you learned that in, in, you know, in everything you've been building over the last 12 months with, with Dojo Islands? Like what have you learned about this younger generation in terms of how they learn and the experience that they expect? Because I think we spend a lot of time thinking that, uh, this younger generation will expect their everyday experiences to feel more like a game, to feel more like, you know, Roblox level interactions. Anything you could share there around like how you think this Gen Alpha wants to learn? Yeah, I would, I would take, a, <clears throat> I would reverse that in a way and, and take a different spin. Like you could say they want more things to feel like a game, uh, but I also think they kind of want a lot of games to feel less like games. So you kind of, kind of see that in things like, uh, uh, like a teacher told me that her kids were playing Fortnite, but instead of shooting each other, this was before Fortnite creative, they were just finding a cave, agreeing not to shoot each other and just chatting in the cave on voice chat, um, which is kind of an example of using that as a social space. And so and I think that goes to the point that what I see with, with this generation is a lot of kind of hybridization or there's not as much of a line between virtual and real and game and not real. Uh, sorry, game and not game. Um, like a community can be a game, a game can be a community. And so, um, yeah, that kind of influences a lot of how we're thinking about it and, and the design of it. It's not kind of taking something and adding gamey stuff to make it fun, uh, nor is it exactly, you know, I, I, I think a lot, but I think they're looking for kind of more cozy community spaces, definitely that they're used to being able to kind of um, play just with their friends. There's a huge reason the slightly older generation is so into kind of pseudonymity and, and things like that, that it's um, the this this sort of original Facebook model of a massive, you know, completely public network, I, I don't think is attractive to them. Um, so yeah, kind of the, the being able to create tight knit communities is a, is a big part of what we're doing. And then a very blurry line between whether that's a game or just a space you hang out in or a space where that has lots of little toys in it. You know, it's, it's not a hard, hard sort of line for, for what it is, I think, for me. I, I think that is such, such a great point in terms of the nuance of how the next wave of technology experiences will feel because they may feel like this hybrid game community. And now, obviously, with AI and PCs, you'll have more companions and, and living in this Westworld style experience of speaking with, with AI or real people is all going to be pretty blurred. Um, but, but I, I, I think it would, be, it would be great possibly to end on this, on this question around when you think about the future of AI and education, you know, I can see a world where every kid has this endlessly patient AI tutor. Um, and I, I'm just curious to get both of your, your takes here. You know, where do you think AI is going to fit in into class dojos? future and more broadly the future of education yeah i, I can go i mean we're, we're doing some things with ai already around um <clears throat> uh, uh on our on the tutoring side we haven't mentioned that at all but there's sort of a tutoring platform on class dojo and we're kind of uh doing a kind of a teacher co-pilot there initially so something that can kind of support a human teacher as they're teaching um i do think everyone kind of shares that same ultimate vision of you know, the kind of guide tutor that, that works with you. 
Um, however, I, I sort of, um, I, I think maybe there's a, uh, a simplistic way that we're looking at that now. Like we're so influenced by seeing chat GPT and that's amazing. And, and it's this like two way conversation where AI talks, I talk, AI talk, you know, I talk. And so you instantly imagine a tutor kind of working that way, uh, and being text based or maybe, you know, voice based, like, uh, we probably imagine, you know, just talking to the, <clears throat> talking to the AI and, and it talking back and that being a tutor. Um, but I think it, it's more exciting to think about sort of multimodal versions of that. Like, can it, would it bring up the right game at the right time? Would it sort of play a particular video at the right time? And it, it being sort of not necessarily the, the sort of two way Socratic conversation. Um, another thing I'll, to bring it back to Dojo Islands quickly that I'll say is, uh, something we discovered is that when you have that community, you can give them much harder problems. So like we were hiding things around the Island and if there's just one kid, it, you know, takes them a really long time to find those things if we made it too hard. But if you put in 20 kids, then it's sort of a, you know, group wisdom of the crowd things, they'll find it and find everything in five minutes and all tell each other. And they've all sort of learned, they can do the same thing with learning. 20 kids in a room can learn something very quickly by sharing knowledge with each other and so on. So another interesting idea, I think, is to throw kind of AI agents into the mix there. Um, and some of their role could be to sort of hint and prod, but they don't have to do that much prodding to sort of set that sort of excitement and that knowledge gossip mill in the in the twenty person group goings and until they figure out how to do the problem. It's just sort of hints at the at the most important times, I think. Uh if anything, you know, you you'd want your AI tutor to not give away too much. Like they want to guide you through things and uh I think with Chat GPT now, you know, it's great for a knowledge dump of things, but it's not um, deceptive enough to hold back on, you know, to let you, uh, to, to let you kind of actually give, give the answer or come to the answer yourself. So I'm kind of excited about like, uh, yeah, more ways we can kind of prompt to create that sort of nuance, that, that kind of, uh, you know, it's a positive deception that a teacher will do sometimes. Uh, and also how AI agents can work in a group context. Uh, cause I think, you know, I'm really excited about how powerful that can be uh, for learning beyond just the one-on-one -on -one that is, I think, the first one that comes to mind when you talk about an AI tutor. Yeah, making learning multiplayer. Exciting. Yep. Sam, what about you? I think Liam covered a lot of it, but um, like it's, people have acknowledged for a long time that teaching is a really hard job, particularly when you've got a lot of kids in the classroom. It's really hard. Um, and so I think the idea of a co-pilot that can either remove toil, <laughs> unnecessary toil, um, or help you um, be a better teacher for every kid is a really exciting idea. So I think that's, that's it seems like that's going to be very important. I think the other, the other um, vision that I think basically everyone in Silicon Valley loves this one of, you know, the, the, the young ladies illustrated primer type thing where every kid has an infinitely compassionate tutor in their pocket. I, I think that's like basically available. <laughs> you know, like, um, I, I think the form factors and things are, are need to improve, but I, I actually just don't think that's um, how people enjoy learn how, how young people really enjoy learning. Uh, as Liam said, talking to the talking to the chatbot, it, I, I think there there are there are better ways, and I think the better ways usually involve sparking motivation and interest, and that usually comes from other people, um, or interactions with other people. So I'm I'm I think there's definitely a role for it. I think like the AI tutor is one vision. There there may be others too. It's good to explore the space. Wow, let, let, let's end it on that note. You know, it it, it keep exploring, keep discovering. And uh, thank you both for being here today. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, it's been great.